Okay, everybody, welcome back. We just got interrupted. Uh, my internet went down. Right when we were talking about something big, uh, having to do with fancy guys. Um, so we're gonna totally hone in on anything anything doesn't want us to talk about. Uh, so good job with your strategy, buddy. Um, okay, so I was like, okay, they're. Uh, the antiverses seem to be like a lymphatic system where it's uh, compressing them in the immune system. Any vi uh, viruses that invade the body concept for the multiverse from other multiverses that are invited is like as what I read. It's a way to process them through those uh, antiverses before they are then able to invade the universes of light. Um, and then uh, go down to the <laughs> so, your voice is kind of fading out to me i can't hear you uh, for some reason no uh, make certain that um make certain hello. your microphone hello. can you hear me yeah i can hear you okay it's cool. low though interesting okay okay <laughs> better now thank you okay so then uh i also track back a bunch of these uh, concept uh multiverses ultraverses uh, I call another thing that's beyond those all ultraversal bubbles because it has a different form of space uh, physics that uh, I call this the plane of authority because it it uh, runs through a bunch of powerful source spirits to go through. It's like a school and to become management and authorities in particular topics such as divinity safety love fortressing offense defense all all, the, all these kind of categories of concepts and experience so there's all and then those beings will sometimes form universes uh because there's a lot a lot of them that uh will um be advanced in a one particular concept and po possibly a few others but like uh, will then also bring in immigration uh, based on its rules. Uh, this universe that I found, and this in multiverse, is kind of like a melting pot universe, similar to the U.S., uh, where it will take in all the the multiverses. Of, uh, its goal is to eventually take in all the multiverses. It started off making it more quarantined so that it could maintain order in the beginning, and then uh once the invasion started coming in it had to flood that in and prepare for it uh but it, it's working up to then bringing in the more darker things as an equation so that it can resolve everything to eventually peace or some t form of unity or uh, order in working with them all because then that grows a bigger authority to affect everything else um so I, I do track back a bunch of these evil universes or like pure evil, chaos evil, uh, order evil, uh, a lot of uh, concepts of uh, toxins, these bi uh, things bleeding over that are similar to Stephen King's mist, uh, like in some of the things in uh, the antiverse. Uh, yeah, not all. Uh, of these beings on the in the antiverse are like bad they're more oriented to being top predators in in their space um so their f moral code is different uh in natural law because it's like everywhere um but there are like ex i've seen some exchanges between the antiverse and this one like uh with uh you know s satan whatever you want to go into like uh, i've seen a lot of predators claim to be sane. Uh, it's like the, it's a continuous like uh, Wizard of Oz thing where something wants to replace it and, and uh, prevail this like uh, unstoppable power. And a lot of them get like run through or destroyed and then something replaces them. But a lot of like with you where you said set uh, Ebus or whatever, um, uh, some other apex predators of the past from different countries like uh, will take up that that title and, and 
ones I've seen inva invading from the antiverse also like to take that title when they're presenting themselves to other people because that's the well-known term that like scares the shit out of people <coughs> um and uh yeah uh yeah there's uh i believe a remedy that earth is trying to do to get the machiavellis and divide and conquer thing that's being put on the ones that are on ultimately on our side for earth back into unity against this ultimate evil that's not having any pr good purpose mm -hmm. what what are you what are your thoughts oh just thank you so much for that and uh, definitely appreciate it i think that uh your experience has been so profound that you have a uh profound view of uh, the multiverse and uh, your multiversal perspective is certainly appreciated. I do want people to understand that, uh, of course, I work with the cosmology that uh, pretty much has to deal with the universe that we're in. And um, I do believe that concentrating on some of these potential universes or uh, parallel universes, uh, it can, of course, uh, distract us. It can serve as a distraction and many people uh, kind of uh, lose themselves. They lose themselves uh, in it and it's something to just be um, aware of uh, that um, some places are just not meant for people to go into. Uh, and uh, what, what it does uh, create, however, is a fascinating potential for understanding uh, different uh, developments, developments that might have been historically or that might yet be historically. So uh, we would, um, in the old think tank days, uh, we'd consider this a kind of uh, kind of gaming. We'd game things out. Now, what's strange to me here is that, uh, you know, when I'm putting the screens up and down, sometimes we're getting a glitch. I hope you're not getting that same effect, but uh, we uh, yeah, otherwise on my end, but like it, it's kind of going away every now and again. So it, yeah, they're they're trying, but yeah, yeah. So see what they don't want you to talk about. I, I'm sure you have some intuition on that. Yeah, and uh, well, I, th I think what they don't want to get into too much is the vampires. Now we came here to kind of talk about that. Our man uh, has has talked about the book. And what I will explain to people is how we got into kind of a conversation when our man, Sean Bond, got knocked off the Internet. So just so everybody knows, this um, entire interview is going to be like um, stitched together when uh, he's done with it and maybe kind of broken up into parts and stitched together again. But uh, however it works out, uh, we covered so much basic ground. And I don't want us to get too far afield. And um, so when he uh, uh, brought me here tonight and we talk a bit about my background and we talk a bit about vampirism, you're not going to really understand what I'm saying about vampirism unless you get the book. So I do want to give everybody a bit of a background behind the book, but uh, just basically buy the goddamn book and uh, you'll be able to understand someone was saying understand that it's only half a book it's uh we had to get everything we could cobble together out as quickly as possible so that we could uh, basically cement copyright on it uh which is something that i was always leery to do uh because uh of the uh of, uh, but by the way, you can take a look at that picture of me on the back of the book. Uh, the front is my mother, but in the back, I look horrible, uh, more like uh, Christopher Christopher Walken than myself. And that is because I was really this worn to death. I'm sorry? Yeah. This yeah. is your mom? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the, uh, but I'm sorry? That's a good picture. Well, thank you. Yes, and uh, the when it comes to the um, a picture of myself on the back, that was after years of taking care of my parents and their decline, and uh, that was uh, my mother entered uh, decline through a catastrophic brain injury, uh, which would have killed any baseline human being. Uh, but um, of course, uh, she was half vampire, um, half vampire, and uh, I myself am a fourth vampire. Now, there's a technical term for that. It's quite real. You can look it up yourself called damfire, meaning that somebody who's not a full-blooded vampire. 
Uh, but uh, the Damfire are anyone who is half or a quarter or uh, further bled down, to use a pun, uh, where their blood's watered down again just to be punished here uh, from true vampirism. But if you were a true vampire, um, almost certainly you would not be female. Well, certainly the Soviet studies into this matter concluded that uh, the vampires were a purely male species uh, because they are a parasitic species. And here we're talking about uh, the sanguinous vampires are sanguivorous, meaning uh, blood uh, eaters. Uh, the uh, sanguivores, uh, the uh, true vampires that are eating blood, not some goddamn psychic vampire or some other kind of subtle variation, which people dignify by calling a vampire. Uh, but basically, vampires, dignified as they can be conceived to be, are still parasitic. And as a parasitic species, uh, they're not functioning like a normal species, which is serving as a host. So, uh, understand that in nature, uh, the overwhelming majority of uh, the gender bias really goes towards the feminine. Uh, we're not talking about social bias. Social bias in human society is obviously patriarchal at this point in history, and uh, that is horrible, and it has its own horrific consequences. Uh, but when it comes to nature, nature is overwhelmingly matriarchal. And you take a look at anything from uh, ant colonies to termitaries and the various social insects, all the way to the species that have no males and the females are reproducing by themselves, or uh, to other uh, variants of this, such as the seahorses, where the women impregnate the men and force the men to carry, rather the men impregnate the woman, but the woman force the men to carry the babies to term. Uh, they force the men to take the baby and basically carry it in their belly and then give birth. Uh, the men suffer the birthing process. That's uh, So seahorses are revolutionary in that sense, but at the same time, uh, the matriarchal nature of nature itself. Uh, some people would therefore make the argument that vampires are unnatural because they are strictly male. But again, this follows a kind of natural pattern here in the sense that as a parasitic species, they every once in a while will impregnate a human woman who will either give birth to a full-blown vampire which will always be male or a damfire like my mother who can be female because she's only half vampire and therefore can give birth to someone like myself who's only a fourth vampire but uh when it comes to pure vampires uh they're always men because men are better able to rape Men are better able to kill, men are better able to brutalize, men are better able to terrorize, men are just, um, they're just uh, force projection machines. And therefore, um, there's every reason that vampires would only be male. Uh, so there is a natural logic going on there. And uh, every once in a while, by giving birth to damfires, uh, a female who is raped by them will therefore um, uh, also kind of carry on the species survival by producing someone who can act as a diplomat for them. However, mostly damp fires have been abused as vampire killers. For those of you who don't know, damp fires have always traditionally been viewed as being real, just as vampires are, and historically accepted as real and also historically accepted as the best vampire killers. So uh, this was originally how Dracula's lineage started as knights of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, they were vampire slayers, uh, the original Dracula line. Uh, and uh, this has to do with the damp fire nature of their background. So when it comes to the uh, damp fireism or being a damp fire, the last uh, recorded officially state-sponsored vampire slaying uh, was conducted in Yugoslavia back when it was still Yugoslavia. It has since balkanized uh, into much smaller nations, Serbia, Montenegro, Macedonia, uh, Krvatska, Croatia. Uh, all of these uh, smaller nations were once part of a federative socialist republic of Yugoslavia, and it was in that communist republic that a state paid for vampire slaying took place conducted by a damp fire, someone who was half vampire. This was in the 
1950s or 1970s. Uh, I'd have to look back through my notes. And it's it should be in the book. If it's not in the book, um, it's in the part that's missing from the book. <laughs> so just so people get that. Um, and we'll get back to what it's like to be a vampire, uh, in a sense, where I was talking to our man, uh, John Bond, about that when we were offline. Uh, here's the deal that uh, you need to understand um, uh, with the book. Uh, basically, I was working with a, when I first came out as a public informant, uh, 2000, and uh, by the way, if you ever hear various cultists of the Kings of Edom uh, that are attacking my character, uh, they say all kinds of bullshit about all kinds of crap. And uh, what they really get mixed up is the chronology. Uh, and understand that I started appearing on Coast to Coast AM as caller back around the time my parents were still alive. So my father died 2007, my mother died 2011. So I was really starting to come out around 2007 and started appearing more and more on Coast to Coast AM as a caller and uh, got on Coast to Coast AM itself as a guest around 2011, 2012. So uh, we're talking about that period of time when my mother died was the year of Fukushima Daiichi, same month as a matter of fact, same week. Uh, and, uh, so within that span of time, uh, I was already a public informant. Now, by the time that my mother died and I became a, uh, public informant, fully outed as such, uh, then of course, Colonel Michael Aquino dispatched assets of his, uh, to try and maintain some kind of handle on me and, uh, tether me, uh, keep me kind of, uh, under control. And, uh, so Lorian Ann Fenton was the first of those. And uh, Lorian Ann Fenton uh, wanted to take advantage of the fact that before I met her, uh, before she was dispatched uh, as an asset assigned to uh, basically handle myself, uh, maintain me under control uh, in the sense of preventing me from uh, basically accessing the public uh, to any great degree. Uh, and by the way, you might say, knowing this, why did you take her on as quote unquote a manageress? Uh, understand most of the people out there who don't deal with espionage, you don't realize that as a spy who comes in from the cold situation, you don't really have a choice. Uh, it's better that than having people constantly trying to kill you. It's better that than having to deal with so many other burdens. Uh, and uh, at any rate, uh, it's almost impossible to do anything alone. So you need to almost team up with even an assigned handler to get something out there uh, than doing it by yourself where you can't get anything out at all. So there's a, you may be turned into, at least for a time, controlled opposition, but um, otherwise you won't get anywhere. So I had to get started, get on um, some platform. In my case, it was Revolution Radio. I wouldn't have gotten that without Lorian and Fenton. Um, so it was there was all this that is the nuance of the situation. Now, when it comes to the some of the nuance of that situation, um, when I was working by myself, my mother's still alive, still taking care of her in her final days. I was involved as a public informant with an idiot. I think his name was John Michael Greer, I think who ran a show called shadowsinthedarkradio.com. He was loosely affiliated with Ripley's Believe It or Not, and he was he purchased Mysteries Magazine. Now, the woman who had Mysteries Magazine ran it for years successfully. He purchased it and ran it to the ground in two issues. Basically, two to three issues, it was dead meat in the water. Uh, its main readers as a pulp rag magazine, in other words, uh, you know, paper magazine, actual product, were prisoners and the military and uh which is both kind of like the same audience and so um he refused to do what i suggested which was look you own the magazine you can produce a special issue anytime you want and i produced a very long uh article for him at his insistence so he could publish it and it never got published so we decided to expand that into a book but the article he gave the stupid title because he wanted me to write about both vampires and zombies, neither of which are undead. <laughs> that is an ancient superstition 
Um, vampires are very much alive. Zombies are impacted in such a manner that you might think they're dead or reanimated, but they're technically alive. Uh, the undead is kind of a stupid term to apply to either case. And uh, when I uh, told him this, he said, well, it's a selling point because both of these had something to do with communism in terms of the exploitation of both of these conditions. So he called it the Red Undead. So this very long article I wrote called The Red Undead, uh, at great exhaustion to myself, uh, staying up several nights and losing sleep over days and days, he never used. So Laurie and Ann Fenton said, let's hire a professional writer to turn it into a book. But of course, she didn't want to pay anybody. So somebody came forward and volunteered himself, named David John West. And David John West was a Mormon guy who ultimately uh, used myself as a consultant in a short story that was the most popular short story in the anthology of short stories titled uh, Space Eldritch uh, and Eldritch Stories with a Space Theme. And uh, so when I served as a consultant for that, the one thing I noticed was he didn't want to use one term that I said should be used. I said, if you're using this in your short story, he credits me in the anthology, by the way. Uh, I'm the last credit, which is the most important. People remember the first and the last. Um, I'm the last guy he credits as a consultant. And uh, everybody loves his short story. I always thought we should have written many more of them. But um, he and I never found the time to get together. And then somewhere along the line, he grew to hate me. But um, originally, we were very good friends, very intimate, shared quite a bit. Um, and he uh, never blamed me initially, at least consciously, for his wife's attempt to try and sleep with me. And uh, he handled that very well and put his blame elsewhere. And ultimately, I guess all that soured. But the point was, for a period of time there, he volunteered to expand The Red Undead into a larger book format. But the problem was he was a fiction author and he tried to make this into a novel type story. And as Sean Bond can tell you, he's got the book. This is a series of medical notes. You can't turn this into a goddamn novel. It's like taking Grey's Anatomy, the medical textbook, and trying to novelize it and add romance. It's just a stupid idea. And it doesn't uh, work at all. He was trying to basically take the fact that I had encountered one of these artificially created female vampires, which the Soviet Union had created. It tried to create female vampires, and it did so by the most primitive method in the days before genetic engineering through medical and surgical means, basically supermassive blood transfusions, uh, killed most of the people that they worked with and uh, wound up uh, finally succeeding with very few female vampires created artificially. And uh, those that survived the process in mind and body, because understand, this isn't something like you just are, it's not something even as simple as say, for instance, look at this, you know, a woman becomes pregnant and her body is built in such a way that it can accommodate that. But she changes. Her, her very bones begin to warp. Um, what's inside her takes so much energy, the woman take, literally changes shape. So say the woman gets an abortion, and what that does is it takes that bodily rebalance and takes away the cause of that bodily rebalance, and she's not pregnant anymore, that alone warps again the physical nature of everything she's contending with. And, and so just as the postpartum blues delivering the baby creates suddenly the loss of what she had bonded with, carrying this being under her heart for nine months, and she's left with this sense of loss and, and depression, uh, you get that instantly with the abortion and you get everything changing for men can never begin to even comprehend the, the horror of pregnancy, uh, of eating for two people. Uh, it's a terror, like having a tapeworm that's devouring everything you're eating. Uh, the Everything about that 
if you were to suddenly become a vampire and not even suddenly these women who were made into such by the Soviet Union had to go through months and months and months of torture uh, to transform. Think of something far beyond pregnancy. You're changing what you subsist off of. You're suddenly subsisting off of blood. Your entire body changes to accommodate that. You're no longer going to think the same way. All of the processes biochemically have changed. So you no longer think like a human being. You are now thinking like a non-human. You are thinking as someone who is beyond human. So uh, basically, you are no longer part of the human link in the food chain. Uh, for all human beings, you all think that you're the apex predators because you have denuded the earth of entire species. But the reality is you're not at the top at all. You're towards the middle. Human beings are at the same level somewhere between an anchovy and a pig. You are something that eats far more vegetables than you eat meat. Now, granted, there's plenty of Americans who have done their best to warp that diet and eat as much meat as possible and almost never touch their vegetables. But the reality is humanity as a whole is far more vegetarian than it is predatory in nature subsisting off of meat. At the top of the food chain, apex predators are pure meat eaters. This is all they're going to eat is other forms of life. So human beings are nowhere near that. In fact, if a human being were fed nothing but meat, they would die. <laughs> they would die fairly quickly. It might take a few years, but you can't live like that. This is hence the balanced diet. So you are not like my mother. My mother was very close to an apex predator. My mother hunted people down and killed them and drained them of blood. She could do that. I am only a fourth vampire, not half. I cannot drain a person dry. My mother had the capacity physiologically to hold 12 liters of blood, that much blood from an adult male in her belly, like she was suddenly pregnant, like a camel hump. She could carry that and sustain herself for weeks from an exsanguination, from draining someone dry. I do not have capa that capacity to imbibe that much blood. So when it comes to the human tropic level, your ability to subsist off of sustenance, if you were on a scale of one to five, a primary producer would be a plant, and five would be the apex predator, a pure animal that eats so much off the food chain in terms of meat that it has few predators of its own. Between that, human beings are in there in the middle, uh, 2.21 on average, uh, basically uh, roughly equal to an anchovy or a pig. So all of you think differently because of it. When you suddenly become an apex predator, say the Soviets did to you what they did to so many of these women that they tried to dispatch as agents for the Soviet state. You suddenly are thinking so radically differently that most of them went insane. They simply could not maintain the sense of balance between their new diet and anything that anchored them to humanity anymore. Since other human beings become food to you, 
then you can't relate to them. Do you understand what I'm saying? So since you can't relate to them, since they're like cattle, then your ability to even talk to them diminishes. So this is the issue to understand. People have romanticized vampires and they think of them as some of the most elegant and uh, erudite and well-read and uh, sophisticated cosmopolitans around are bane and seductive. And all of this is a product of the Dark Ages and the Black Plague. During the time of the Black Plague, vampirism became conflated with nobility because of the ignorance abounding at the time. And it was due to the fact that the nobility imbibed a lot of silver to ward off the Black Plague. Now, colloidal silver no longer does this. You can imbibe colloidal silver that's on the market, and unless you're imbibing toxic amounts of it, you should be fine if you're taking it at a controlled level responsibly. But it's an antibiotic. And in the old days, they used pure silver, silver coins as an antibiotic, the metal, would destroy min, many of the germs that were in the water. Uh, so what the nobility would do would be they would liquefy it through their alchemists into colloidal silver. And this was edible, potable. So when their alchemists did this during the Black Plague, the nobility would be drinking this on a daily basis and they would never get the plague. But at the same time, the effect would be to turn many of them blue. You can look up a case of a man who took too much colloidal silver and he turned blue. He, they called him Papa Smurf. There are also people, entire tribes born with this condition, some morbidly inbred families in the Appalachian Mountains, for instance. And this is uh, basically a kind of uh, blood change, hence the term blue blood. Uh, affiliated with nobility. They called them blue bloods because many of them had turned literally blue. Now to the peasantry, they looked dead. And the peasants began to wonder why are so many millions of us dying? But the nobility has turned blue and they survive. They never die. And it was assumed the nobility was undead, that they were living off of the deaths of everyone else beneath them. And therefore, the peasantry began to affiliate the nobility with vampirism. This is how that concept developed of Count Dracula, of the Baron, uh, oh God, who was the uh, Strigoi type of vampire, the one, the Nosferatu. Uh, all of this became conflated in the public mind with the nobility also being evil to the point where people thought, oh, nobility is evil, nobility is parasitic, uh, we must get together with our pitchforks and torches and burn the castle down. This is what led to peasants' rebellions that had to be put down by the dynasties. But this is where the concept comes from of nobility, blue blood, and vampirism all conflated in the public mind into this idea of the erudite, educated vampire. Now, the only reason the original Vladislav Sepish, Dracula, fit into that stereotype was at the time that he was originally a vampire, vampire hunter. His father was half vampire. He was a fourth vampire. He was like me. But he suffered on the field of battle a near-death experience. And in his case, his clinically dying, as I did, triggered that recessive gene. And that triggering of that recessive gene enabled him to become far more hematophagic than he was before. And he was able to take blood as a subs as a essence of sustenance, which before that period in life, he had been unable to. Now I have been clinically dead. So in that sense, I am arisen. In that sense, it was the same with Dracula, the original, who became Nosferatu Rex, the king of the undead. The reason why, 
was because as someone who became vampiric because of the recessive gene kicking in with the near death experience, basically he was undead. So again, conflation, confusion. Is a person who suffers a near death experience undead? Of course not. They are as alive as you and I and vampires are alive. Uh, they do what they can to mimic the dead at times as a survival mechanism like playing possum. And that was why they became conflated again with the undead. Also, they spread rabies or have the potential to spread rabies. Uh, and as a result, you suddenly see many people who degenerated and they thought of these people as being vampirized. Uh, this is what I go into in the book. And the problem was when we were dealing with David John West. He tried to take my encounters with the female vampire in the Balkans when I was serving as a mercenary there. He tried to take that and romanticize it and turn it into a love story on which the rest of the narrative would pivot. And I said, I don't want to talk about it. It's a very private memory. Other than sharing the fact that it happened, I was not going to go into depth with it. And he therefore had nothing to work with. And he was fired from the project. So when he was fired from the project, two years later, we got it published, even to the point where it has an ISBN number. It's on Amazon. The Red Undead is on Amazon with an ISBN number, ISBN. You don't get that unless a book is published. It's like a social security number. You don't get one unless you survive the birth canal. <laughs> Once you get out of the birth birthing process, and if you make it through that, you get a social security number. So it was published. He suddenly uh, was recruited by one of my most active gang stalkers to claim it was never published. And that way he telegraphed before he punched. He rattled before he struck. I knew, holy shit, he's going to take all my notes. He's going to publish them and claim they're his because he was given the credit of being the co-author on The Red Undead because we felt he had volunteered his time. He got fired. So we just left his name on as co-author is kind of like just as he had credited me for as a consult for his short story in the book, uh, the anthology, Space Eldridge. So he was going to now run with it. So we had to get something out there immediately. And what we did was we cobbled all the notes we could together that we got out there immediately, but half the book is missing. So when you buy vampirology, you get a lot of the physiology of the vampires, but none of the history or not enough. All of that will be presented when we revise and expand the book, and we will do that, but enough of you have to buy this one. I swear to God, this was never intended as a marketing gimmick. <laughs> Honest to God. No, it's just, go, go for it. Yeah, this as, is you're, the, as you're talking, we're, we're getting a lot of hits um, in the spirit, so unseen. A lot of, like, um, can you feel any pressures on your head while you're talking? Oh, absolutely. By the way, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've been tracking it back, and so like I lo love that you're uh, brave and in going into your uh, family lineage origins. I'd love to hear more on that, guys. Uh, I also have tracked back quite a, a bit of uh, DNA lineages in my mind. One much older though, uh, so it's way watered down uh, into sanguine. Um, and when I was dealing with it, uh, it seems there's some overarching predator that's uh, monitoring the entire lineage that's uh, pretty high in awareness that seems to be trying to puppet every, everything and orient uh, the, the hunt uh, lust. Um, it, your book goes into, I think it says, the uh, Vampire Prime. Um, it, it might have something to do with that. Uh, you, you said that the vampires can live, uh, 300 years plus. Um, uh, so I'm wondering if, if they've ac accumulated like more, mm, you know, like, uh, how some people are like, uh, like, oh, I only need, I want the best blood or, uh, they are also expanding their their tech into stealing more than just blood but like the soul the life force the abilities the the part a uh, soul uh, all, all these uh subtle energy parts and authority uh i feel <laughs> no. uh, there's a predator that is 
trying to watch this and I'm, I'm letting them know that we're not here to threaten the vampires we're at, uh we i i we both see them as a in, integral part of the yeah the, the ecosystem the like system okay of this let world. me let me put it this way i i, I uh, it's important to qualify all of this i appreciate what you're saying sure. and what you're talking about is of course uh basically a kind of uh consciousness a meta consciousness uh, a meta consciousness that um, might act as a kind of uh, uh, ultimate hope for vampiric survival as an ethnos. And uh, that is mm -hmm. important. And I will get into that more in the future. I feel that that would be too abstract right now. Uh, but uh, one of the things that um, is also important is that people understand, say, for instance, the um, when it comes to uh, the, <sighs> the vampiroid experience and uh, what we, we now have already articulated as to why the book is truncated the way it is. Uh, and again, the photograph on the back of the book of myself, uh, it, looking so Christopher Walken-like, uh, I mean, you can be honest about this, Sean Bond. You might say if that photograph looks like me at all or just barely like me. But honestly, that's directly after almost a, over a decade without barely any blood that I ever drank. I, I refrained from drinking blood for all the while I was taking care of my parents for the most part. Very seldom did I get an opportunity to drink any blood during the 11 years I was their care provider. And it shows, it shows I look very aged in that photograph. I look as if I've abused drugs for 10 years, which is basically a sleep deficit uh, from 30 years, to three different careers in which I barely slept at all compared to any regular human being. And uh, then what happened was uh, the stress of caring for them and their advocacy beyond anything any normal human being could have done. It would take hours to describe why. The end result was what you see there is a train wreck. And obviously, when I began drinking blood again and availing myself of that, I began to reverse that aging process. I obviously, I feel, look much younger now than I do in that photograph. Uh, and um, I think Sean would probably agree. I, I, I don't know, but <laughs> you know, your input on that is appreciated. Or maybe you could say it looks the same to me. I, I couldn't care less. It just is what it is. But uh, you can see that my hair is much thinner. My hair is much thinner in that photograph uh, than the hair I have today. Yes. And uh, yeah, I basically, I, I feel look like shit. Uh, but um, at any rate, uh, then Peter Moon, of course, had to choose that photograph. But all that being said, the uh, where we're at now, let me try and explain this to people. Um, I can communicate with you because I'm only a fourth vampire. For somebody who's truly a full vampire, an apex predator, and yes, people have been killing vampires, slaying them is the term they use, for thousands of years, but then people have also hunted sharks. There are Polynesians whose very name in their language means shark hunter. But what happens when people overdo it? We've hunted sharks to the brink of extinction, and it's wiped out the ecosystem of the oceans. You have hunted vampires nearly to extinction now, and you're all paying the price in collateral damage in ways you can't even begin to comprehend. Vampires are some of the reason for your evolution by forever terrorizing you from behind and prodding you to go ever forward. That's how you took the land away from the much more brutal humanoids, the hominids that are known as the Yeti, the Agagwe, the Sasquatch. Mm. These hominids dominated the earth. And the only way you frail, pink, pale, Vegetable eating humans, <laughs> you hairless apes ever overwhelmed them was because we continually terrorized you from behind in the dark at night. Homo nocturnus, the night man. And that's why you had to leave your caves and leave the dark and go out and battle the brutes and overswarm them and ultimately take half the world away therefrom. 
So you owe us your very existence. You owe us the reason that you're civilized because humanity suddenly developing cities, becoming social animals that were urban in nature, that is the equivalent of the honeybee breaking up its hive and forming separate family units instead of being a collective. That is so radical. What on earth ever provoked that? The terror of the vampire in the night. The hunter-gatherer could not survive that constant predation and had to gather in cities for security. This is what created the essence of the night watchman. That required a police force. All of this you owe to us. But the vampires, I speak for them because they cannot speak for themselves. The difference is, as apex predators, as all apex predators are, vampires are charismatic. They're not blue or deformed or undead. They're rather, imagine a Greek statue without an ounce of fat and alabaster white. This is the typical vampiric complexion and physique. So these men that look like Greek gods, like classical Homeric heroes, they are at a state of development that requires no maturity. As I was saying to our man Sean Bond when we were offline, think about that time that you were pre-adolescent. There's a price to pay for the ability to reproduce. The moment a woman is able to bear a child, the moment a man is able to seed a child, you are on the clock. At that point, you begin to age really age to the point where your cells are no longer reproducing at a level where you're childlike. It's like an axolotl taken out of water and is no longer a water dog. It becomes a mud puppy, basically a salamander and dies soon thereafter. The only way the axolotl can survive <laughs> is forever being submerged in water and remaining forever fatal basically a fetus all their lives. Uh, and with the vampire, you're at that stage of cellular regeneration of a pre-adolescent. They mature only in the sense of being like an adult human, and this is what will happen with the wealthy elite when we begin using genetic engineering much more aggressively, and we enter an age of life extension uh, age repression, what they call the anti-agarthic stage of human development. This anti-agarthic stage is when those among us who are genetically tweaked basically have the injections required so that their cells begin to regenerate in the pre-adolescent sense, reverse their aging, stop aging, basically become a human being who does not age. Once you are in that state, your mind changes and you are like a child who is pre-adolescent. You are no longer on the clock where you're reproducing while you yourself are dying. The moment you go into adolescent maturity and you're able to seed or bear that seed within your womb to fertility and into uh, delivery, you're on that clock towards death. That's the price you pay for being able to seed new life. But when you're pre-adolescent, through life extension, anti-agarthic technology, you begin to think like that pre-adolescent again. Every moment of your day is the present moment. You no longer think on chronological time. You think in cosmological time. Just as a child, there's no sense of the past or the future in any great sense, every moment is the present moment. You are always in the moment. The child doesn't relate to adults. Adults are the voice in the background, like a Charlie Brown cartoon. Wah, 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 wah. The child relates to other children. You relate to your peers. 
and you relate to the cartoons you see, you relate to uh, very few things other than that which you grasp at the childlike level. But the one thing that you really relate to is that time is timeless. Everything takes forever. To a child, it's, are we there yet? Are we there yet? But when it comes to the vampire, that's where they're at. You're talking about someone who's never had to mature. They are aging at such a slow rate. They can live for two to 300 years. They are forever in the present moment. You are food to them. They have no ability to communicate or talk with you. It's like, imagine an extremely charismatic, autistic child in the body of a Greek god, alabaster white, perfect physique, and unable to communicate. Yet most people would not be afraid of him because he's so sexy, so attractive. They would be seduced by him. If he can't talk, most people wouldn't care because he looks so fuckable. That's your average vampire. They can't relate to each other like children do because they're competitors. They range like wolves with their own territory. They don't pack. That's completely antithetical to their nature. They're more like lone wolves, every one of them. So they will fight each other for territory, for the bleeding. So once you enter that state of mind, your relatives would no longer look like anything you relate to. So anything you fantasize about vampires, get rid of it. Think instead in terms of an autistic adult extremely autistic adult along the further end of the autistic spectrum <coughs> who is basically predatory uh, and has a, enough of a hardiness where they can be homeless and not have the impact that homelessness has on a baseline human. Uh, they can sleep in cold warehouses, mausoleums and crypts so as not to be bothered and come out and basically attack humans and disappear back into the dark. These are people who have no need to relate to anyone. They simply appear, take what they want, and they leave. Usually anyone who survives their attack will be left with a fake memory because their saliva implants a euphoric, uh, the uh, kind of tryptophan uh, that you find in LSD and other uh, ecstasy type drugs the dimethyltryptyline, the DMT. They, via their saliva, transfer that into your blood while they take yours. If you survive an attack without being exsanguinated, completely drained, your memories will be completely biochemically altered. You'll think you saw them turn into a mist or turn into a voron, a raven. And that brings us back to the totemic animal of Odin, which often visits Sean Bond. That is the totemic animal of the vampire. The blood-sucking bat is a creature of the new world. That's more totemic to the Aztecs and their blood sacrifices. The Eurasian vampire, there was no such thing as blood-sucking vamps in the bat form anywhere in Eurasia. They're all frug, frugivores, fruit bats. The real totemic animal of the vampiric ethnos is the royal school de lac, the voron, the raven, that was the vulture of Europe. And in the massive battlefields of Europe, it was the ravens that would feast off the dead bodies through all the interminable wars and plagues. And some of them became mutated to the point where the dead human body was all they could feed off of. That's when they went from being a Voron or a Raven to a Vrayu Skoldalak, a true eater of the dead and an eater of living humans. These kinds of Ravens became so gorged on human flesh, they grew and they would sweep babies out of their cribs and devour them. This is the kind of totemic animal of the vampire of Europe the raven. Uh, and this, of course, is like the vulture, that which brings the dead to the other world. That's why they're the messengers of Odin. 
Does that make sense to the other side? So that true is the totemic animal of Dracul, the family Dracul and the whole bloodline, the lineage thereof. When it comes to vampires, then think of them as childlike adults forever in a pre-adolescent state of development. No need to mature. Your suffering is funny to them, just like when a child looks at a cartoon and sees the Porky Pig or the Daffy Duck and they're hit with a hammer or a baseball bat and the stars come out and the child just laughs. Ha ah! ha Because the child has no concept of suffering. The child has no conscious. The child looks at the suffering of the cartoon characters falling off cliffs and blowing up and going through walls and he says ha ah, look at how funny that is. that's what you are to the vampire the vampire laughs at your suffering i'm not trying to take away any sympathy for them understand the shark eats you too without hating you but if you're kind to the shark you can pet the shark in the right circumstances so long as there's not blood in the water think of that as how you would try to survive in the presence of a vampire. And in that sense, perhaps the vampire can be tamed. But this is not socialization. Just as a shark can never survive in any aquarium, because the shark must constantly move and never stop, and therefore as an apex predator can never survive in captivity, neither can the vampire. You cannot socialize them. So the closest analogy, and as all analogies, it has its limits, and it's a poor analogy, yet one of the few that rather fits. Think of the horror movie franchise, Wrong Turn. Both these were deformed, toxic, industrial effluvia, toxic waste created mutants that were cannibals, but they had these human-like European relations who ultimately drew in victims for them, who could speak even with European accents and opened hotels so they could feed their family. That would be somewhat the role that I feel, not to lure you into a human version of a roach motel to feed you to vampires, but I act as their emissary only in the sense they can never speak for themselves. Literally cannot speak in any coherent form you would understand to any great degree. Uh, like an autistic child limited in their ability to express, you would consider it an expressive asphasia. So when it comes to the role that I fill, it's to create an understanding for why they are to be preserved as you would the shark or the wolf or any apex predator. Why they must be preserved in that sense and why you must never hate them for their killing any more than you would hate any other act of God. A tornado, a hurricane, an earthquake takes your loved one. Do you hate God? Do you hate all creation? Do you hate nature? Most people, no. Therefore, you can't hold it against a vampire taking your relation in that sense either. But people did. Hence, they abused people like myself, exploited them, damn fear to hunt, vampire down and the results the consequences have been catastrophic overpopulation uh much else that you're unaware of the collateral damage has been unspeakable so we must help the vampire survive the first step in that is simply understanding them you would do that by reading the book and enabling me to get a, a revised and expanded edition out where the history uh, will then be fully explored and explained. Uh, that being said, um, the uh, Sangwavor Vampir, uh, understand that they are overwhelmingly Europoid. They are overwhelmingly Christian. Understand that when... Yes, the... All of these things become conflated and confused in a diabolic or demonic sense that the Edomites have taken advantage of. Think of what I said about the swastika, now perceived as a symbol of the ultimate evil, 
is your true ward <laughs> against the anti-gods and the original Christian cross. Think as well that when it comes to the vampire, when you hear the term Edom that I have used, it simply means red, representing the red soil of the red lands that surrounded Israel at the time of the Canaanites and the Israeli conquest, the annihilation of that race when the Israelis stole their land and the Israelis were surrounded by hostile enemies and the red lands to the south were known as Edom, red lands, red. Adam, the name of the first recognized man, fully recognized because he became cognizant of his humanity in a new sense. Adam was a farmer. He was white. He was Caucasian. He was in the Caucasus Mountains region, south thereof, where the very word Caucasian comes from. Adam was known as Red. Adam, Edom, they're the same word, just in a different language. He was called red because white people are the only people whose blood can be seen in the face. This blood in the face is called the blush. When a white person blushes, they blush all over. It's a bodily flush. However, since most of the time you see them with clothes on, you see it only in the face. But in reality, their entire body turns red. Hence, Adam had this complexion. Hence, he was called red. Also, he worked the red soil, the red earth, and tilled it, hence was known as red as well. All of this is important because Adam, Edom, one is known as pure raw evil, the other known as the father of man. He was the father of man in this sense. He was not the first man in the biological sense. He was the first man in the conceptual sense. Because Adam, working the farmland, had to have a concept of seasonal time. You had to know when to reap, when to sow. And when he sowed, he knew he had to keep track of the seasons in order to harvest. Thence, he became the first man with a concept of time, and he introduced the concept of time binding, the calendar. And for that reason, Adam damned us all to time binding. Hence, he was the first man. He was the first man who developed a sense of cognizance of time, and that's when we first developed a sense of mortality. With the hunter-gatherers who lived with the passage of time, moving their hunting grounds per the season, there really was no sense of time. A man died when he died. Most people died in their 20s. So when Adam developed the binding of time, we began to understand our mortality and our aging. And from that, he left the Garden of Eden. We left that Garden of idyllic, Edenic existence outside of time, and we entered this trap of time that forever made us aware of our mortality. That's when we began to die, cognizant we were dying. And that, of course, is the change in all humanity where we left that Garden of Eden in the Adze Chai up there in today's Azerbaijan and the northernmost region of Iran near Tabriz. All of that northernmost region of Iran where Aryan man came from, the very name Iran is simply the word Aryan in Greek. Aryan transliterates into Iran in the Farsi language of Persian from the ancient Greek of Alexander the Great who conquered that land. And so here you have the Caucasoid vampires who subsist off these humans, these farmers. And of course, when you think of Adam, his righteous third son, the righteous third son of Adam, not Cain or Abel, but the one who did as he was told, was named Seth. This didn't in no way, shape, or form makes him satanic. In fact, he was the first Christian. It was Adam who told him that man would someday be redeemed. 
that he had seen the vision of the Lamb in the Garden of Eden, and he sent his son Seth to Christianize the Chinese. His son Seth went into the East, and when he went into the East, he was one of the founding fathers of the Chinese culture by teaching them farming. He taught them farming, and the original keepers of this tradition were the Magi. You can read about them in the Revelation of the Magi, the Chinese mage kings out of the East who came from Jin, the land of China, all the way to Israel, which they invaded with a full army in their attempt to find the Christ. They are the people who baptized the Christ, who was originally just Jesus, son of Joseph, and they made him the Christ, which is a title. It is not a name. It is a title. The Christ means the anointed, and it's never awarded to anyone else before or since. So the Christ was anointed onto him. He had to have someone to baptize him to do that. It was the mage kings who did that, and there were 12 of them, not three. You can verify this by reading the Revelation of the Magi, which is translated from the Syriac, and was written in Christ's time. It was excised from the Bible for political reasons by the church, which maintained the original copy. And that was translated by Brett oh, Loiter, I believe his name is. No, not Brett Loiter. That's a friend of mine. Oh, God. Oh, well, you look up the Revelation of the Magi. You'll find the author. Uh, uh, and he translated it from the Syriac. I'm sorry? I remember you went into this. Uh, I was it was very interesting, uh, like bridging the east and the west and the origins of Christianity. Um, uh, do you mind if I ask you some Please. some things that I came up in questions uh, that I didn't see in the book, and maybe I, uh, in the new book you're going to create? Who knows? Um, yeah. Uh, and before I, I go into that, um, uh, you you did a good job in dispersing the the. The, this, this, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't see them as a um, an enemy. That's uh, it. Uh, that's connected to our DNA lineages. That it is trying to monitor the the race of uh, vam vampires and um, or vampire. Uh, uh, yeah, let vampires. me finish one point though. I do want people to understand that the mage kings in China were their vampire. So it was the vampire who baptized the Christ. Uh, that's why they were worshipped as mage kings in China. Go on. Uh, those vampires were intelligent. They were intelligent because the Chinese were able to basically bring them uh, criminals as sacrifices, a kind of human tithe. And they were therefore accommodated socially. And in that sense, it's not like true vampires are unintelligent. They're simply non-functional in a social sense. Rather, these vampires weren't very functional either. They were living a monastic lifestyle, isolated on the mountains, deep in meditation, receiving tithing from the society <laughs> around them. They didn't need to interact with the society on any large scale. Uh, so their intelligence was more what uh, the people interpreted as magical. It would be like people who respected autistic people and respected their talents and accommodated them and uh, did so without demanding that they socialize. In other words, the relationship that developed was far more uh, mutually beneficial and therefore not so much parasitic as it is in the West or in the rest of Eurasia. And in that sense, because of their power, their strength, their longevity, they were considered the mage kings. In a sense, many of them were probably dampfire, more like my mother, half-breeds. And uh, in that sense, they maintained the cloisters in these hermetically sealed uh, monastic communities uh, because they were able to take care of their relations who were not so socialized as they. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? And uh, please go on with your questions, that having been clarified. Cool. Uh, yeah, I was just like, because uh, uh, I'm trying to see if 
uh, based uh, based on what you're saying, so that there there are ma- uh, magically oriented vampires. Wonderful. I also read into that, um, and with uh, I do. Uh, confirm that um, with what I read before that a lot of the vampires are like uh, I, I would I were I was using the word feral kind of yes. like where they're more predatory yes. uh, and they don't really have the need for you know interacting with a human accumulated knowledge um, I do though read that like um, there's possibly very somehow gained even greater life extension uh older origins of the vampire that seem to have accumulated large amounts of power and greater intelligence than a normal uh one that you usually see whether you know i can't really easily confirm that other than there's something contacting us and that's concerned about the survival of vampires with our bringing out this information that you've actually done fairly well in your explanation uh, while while we're dealing with that head stuff uh, that was coming from it to disarm its fear of what we'd be bringing out in uh, influence of the population. And my thing is also like these things are... Uh, these this species is needed in you know helping mm, limit human expansion that's unnecessary as well as they have a oh shit he glitched we glitched out so we might he he might have lost (laughs) the net did you did you you get did you get knocked off the net are we still on no here do you hear me yeah yeah hello yeah, oh, I hear you. Cool. Okay, trust. <laughs> okay, yeah. So there's a there's um, there's a there's a big drama that they're dealing with, and I think that that one that's listening through mm-hmm. our DNA lineage will be interested to hear the solution for it. Uh, I see a pathway for its evolution. You also used a interesting term, not quite in the way that I'm going to be using, but like you said. Uh, it's like um, their their ascension process or whatever. Uh, 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 van- it, it's I read if they align with Earth uh, in uh, in a really um, well established way in purpose, where like predator hunting dark predators of our species. Yes, that that's are my mother's manipulating did. humanity. On. Oh, nice. Yeah, they get rewards from Earth for doing that. If they if they don't go after just innocence, then they can evolve quite nicely. And, and like you, your book even went into this realm, uh, Glacius, Glacius, which I thought was interesting because I do read they have some realms uh, tied to them, uh, having to do with where uh, the lineage of the concept came from before it got to this Earth realm. Uh, and, uh, yeah, can you go in, into a little bit of that? And then I'll, I'll like, uh, go, I'll, I'll like, oh, because a wall, uh, and, and keep in mind that this, uh, whatever, if it, uh, if it's in a body, if it's a big overarching spirit that's looking over the DNA lineage, whatever it is, it's monitoring us. Uh, thank you for being here and watching. Hey. <laughs> Uh, I would say that Glacis would be um, a good way to understand it would be kind of a vampiric concept of heaven. Uh, it's kind of like where the sun never rises and the uh, it's eternal night and uh, it's uh, generally cold and uh, it kind of uh, what they would consider kind of an idyllic Elysium uh in a kind of happy hunting ground. It, it would be along those lines of the Native American Indians had the concept of the happy hunting ground and uh, in the kind of uh, feral as our man Sean Bond has used uh, the the kind of uh, state that the vampires exist in the present moment um, 
Glacis is kind of uh, their version of that. I think that's probably the most adequate parallel that is comprehensible to the human mind. Uh, one of the most uh, important figures in history to help people understand vampirism is, of course, the historical Dracula. And it needs to be the character, the well, the historical individual needs to be disambiguated from the literary character. But nevertheless, the literary character also shows us certain public perceptions or misperceptions of the historical Dracula. Understand this much that is important. Um, the, the historical Dracula was originally uh, Orthodox Christian, which means part of the Church of Byzantium, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Rite Church, which utilizes the ancient Slavonic liturgy. And uh, this uh, church was the Church of Constantine. This was the original Byzantine Church of the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, what happened was the Church of Roma of the Western Roman Empire, that was a product that emerged hundreds of years later. Um, you could say it was the product of uh, fraud and forgery in that there was a forged letter, uh, which then uh, gave rise to the Western European concept of the papacy. And this is not to insult or assault or somehow discredit the Roman West, the Western Roman Church, but rather to put it in historical perspective, that was the reason for the schism and hostility between the two churches. So when the Church of Western Rome evolved, the Church of the Pope, uh, what happened was the original cross of that church is the Church of the Cross of St. Peter. Uh, St. Peter felt that he was unworthy of being crucified by the pagan Roman Empire in the manner that his God, Jesus, was the Christ. So he has to be crucified upside down. The Romans honored this request and they crucified St. Peter upside down. And St. Peter's cross is the inverted cross. That is a legitimate Christian cross. The inverted cross can also represent the Christian sword of the military, uh, the militarized church, the militia Christi the warrior Christ. And St. Peter's inverted cross is why there's an inverted cross on the throne of the Pope. So the point is that Dracula grew up between these two worlds. His father, who was born into the Byzantine church, was nevertheless a knight of the Holy Roman Empire of Germania the First Reich, which lasted almost a thousand years. The First Reich was established by Charlemagne and lasted all the way through the Napoleonic Wars when it was dissolved by Napoleon Bonaparte. And the First Reich of a thousand years was the, whole, the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. And so you had the original Dracul, the father of Dracula, who was Romanian, but at the same time, a knight of the greater German Reich. And under Emperor Sigismundus of Luxembourg, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, it was Dracul, the father of Dracula, who established the Order of the Dragon, the knights of the dragon who were dedicated to slaying vampires and werewolves, the lycanthropes that plagued Europe at the time. As a matter of fact, Emperor Sigismundus of Luxembourg declared it a law that if anyone denied the existence of werewolves in particular, they were such a danger slaughtering thousands of people that if anyone denied their existence, they would be burned at the stake. This was a problem that was so serious, Europe so plagued at that time by vampires and werewolves that an order of knights was created to slay them. And Dracula was the son of the father who had established that order in the name of the First German Reich. And Dracula himself is literarily, not literally or historically, 
but literarily by the Irish house nigger, basically, because uh, Bram Stoker was an Irishman who became a British citizen and then wound up serving the British nobility by producing novels. He was the medieval Dracula's, the historical Dracula's greatest publicist, but he was also someone who mythified him in what is generally considered a negative sense. And Bram Stoker, he understood the real historical Dracula. He actually was operating on the Romanian theme and it mutated as he continued to write the book. So if you ever read the original novel written by Bram Stoker of Dracula, the original novel says that Dracula, his coffin, must forever have blessed or consecrated soil. In other words, he portrayed Dracula as a Christian. He said his soil in his coffin must be blessed, must be consecrated to help him maintain himself. That was his understanding from the real Romanian history. See, what happened was that the original Christian Dracula, Dracula himself, not his father, his father was assassinated. The original Dracula himself was someone who was considered the champion of Christ. He was someone who fought on behalf of Christendom against the Turks. He was a star crusader. And what happened was, in order to maintain Romania's defense, when he used up all of his own resources, all of his own financial ability to budget his conflicts, he had to turn to the Roman Catholic Church of the West to gain support from the Holy Roman Empire. So he converted from Byzantine Orthodoxy Christendom to Western Christendom Roman Catholicism. At that moment, the church excommunicated him and declared, you will never know no rest. You will be undead. You will never truly die. You will be a vampire. And when that was stated by the Byzantine Orthodox Church, when they excommunicated him and cursed him, the Roman Catholic Church took him on and said he was the champion of Christ. He was the hero of all of Europe, both East and West, at the time that he defeated the Turkish Empire, the most powerful force on earth and saved Europe from conversion to Islam. Therefore, when the original Romanians talked about when Dracula appears or when you encounter him, you make the sign of the cross. That's understood not as a ward, but as a pass. Because no Muslim or Jewish individual would ever make the sign of the cross. That is how Dracula would spare people who encountered him. That was the understanding of the true Christians. So understand the majority of vampires have that Christian tradition, consider themselves doing the acts of God, the work of God by culling humanity. And the original Dracula not only represents that, but literarily, according to the literature of Bram Stoker, he romanticized him by saying that he attended the Romanian magical school of Sholomans. This is Satan's school, the school of uh, the devil himself. And by adding that mystique, what Bram Stoker was doing was he was saying that when Dracula died and reanimated as Nosferatu Rex, the king of all vampires, he retained that magical training from the devil's school of Sholomans in Romania. And therefore, he was not just a vampire, but a great sorcerer, basically someone similar to the Chinese warcerer who was in the Three Kingdoms, someone not just a general capable of tactics and strategy and operations, but capable of sorcery on the battlefield, a magical warrior, a warrior, a mage king, a magi as unto the ancient Chinese mage kings. This is why Dracula is so special and so powerful as a symbol and as a historical figure, this is what helps us to better understand the concept 
of someone who can act as an emissary or an ambassador for that ethnos. So historically, what he did is what I do now. And this is what I'm here for as, in a sense, the last Dracula. And that is something that is my very name, Dietrich, that I inherited from the man who raised and guided me, Dragon. Uh, it also, of course, can be said in the German to represent skeleton key. And of course, uh, that being said, with all that we've covered tonight, I feel that we've done a great service. It must be close to, well, uh, about, um, it must be late where you're <laughs> I'm ready to kind of check in myself, but sure, feel free to I ask know. a few more questions. Feel free to ask any sure. questions you want, and we'll see how long my wind stays up. Sure, sure. And uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. And uh, thank you for coming on and uh, sharing uh, your truths. Um, it helps a lot of people. Um, yeah, and I will definitely want to have you on and uh, put in the comments if you want to see him on, uh, like, and share th this video as much as is possible, please. Um, uh, like, I'll, I got a lot of lists of stuff for later shows, but, like, uh, I'm just going to go into this because it, it is a little bit of uh, keeps trying to grab our attention. Um, whatever that, uh, you know. Uh, seems whatever you want to go into vampiric prime or uh, you know uh, I think it's it seems uh, the, the what I'm tracking back is a little older than uh, the Draku uh, that you're referencing but um, it uh, the things that can help it and any other vampire that and you said they don't go on the internet so <laughs> no, no. It's like yeah. children uh, don't yeah. really go on the internet, uh, not naturally. Uh, yeah, it's not really. Uh, it's not like we got to worry about vampires watching tonight's uh, <laughs> YouTube right. interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the question that was asked, actually, by Sean Bond when we were offline. Yeah, and, and if you are, then, you know, we're, we're not your, <laughs> your enemy. Um, uh, so, yeah, I read that uh, that the whole thing of them being reversed in mind uh, to a childlike state seems to be being perpetuated by something attached to this lineage that is forcing its will on it. Um, this, uh, so th that uh, this manager spirit or whatever that's looking over the lineage that, that's listening to us right now, uh, for a remedy, it's because it's asking, uh, like what, oh, like what we're doing, all those other questions it is asking me. But uh, if you want to get rid of this thing, the thing they're dealing with seems to be in spirit uh, a possession, um, a domination, a forced entanglement, and an a spiritual enslavement, as well as. I recommend an evil evil death. There seems to be some evil spirit that's trying to dominate this lineage of races that's different than this race that's mm -hmm. trying to control it. So, like, another big apex predator that's, like, goes back to, like, evil uh, multiverses and evil sources. Uh, like, if it, the Big Bang, the, the, the source with all, all these branches, each one is a source, uh, your own source in, in that branch... There's ones that they they like to dominate each other, and um, then it's like a big ball of that. Um, so if they detach from it, because it seems to be making them fractured and, and and low sovereign in their in their mind in their their control over themselves. Same thing with the werewolves, which I'm glad that you came up with the lycanthropy because I wanted to ask about that because I do read that as a, a DNA lineage that's passed down as well, uh, mostly yes. dormant. Or, a lot of people have like uh, resonance with it uh, and, and an effect at full moon. So uh, that'll be a fun show too. Uh, uh, and uh, like things trying to dominate that and then lower the sovereignty. So there's less control and, and then make it so that it's a perpetual uh, cycle of the same thing. And then they're all get out get, uh, spreading themselves and, and gathering up uh, blood DNA tech and uh parts and abilities and energy authority from their uh you know victims and then passing that along down to the predator uh system 
uh, that's overarching above it like a puppet master, though I, I believe there's one central one that's like uh, a legit um, like they they earned it. They were they're They're the origin uh, kind of thing. Uh, and they're meant to be overlooking it all. And then there's the illegitimate ones that are trying to dominate that one and, and, and subvert its will and then turn it into a um, more evil presence where, where I don't re read that that's necessary. Um, so, you know, uh, it's already contacting us about that. But like, yeah, we can go into shows about like how to s solve the that problem and make it so that because like that that seems like it would solve a lot of problems for the vampires if if their intelligence was able to increase uh in and as well as empathy in some way not like totally because that would be that would also get in the way of them in their predation <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. but like to the the point where you know they i like that you went into that they have like their own spiritual belief and uh like why they're here in their divine purpose and uh which is interesting yeah if they, and they if they go down that and they can keep evolving uh even more because then there's a divine version of that so yes i am very uh I, i'm just so glad that uh we made this happen and we're going to make it happen again and uh i love you dearly brother sean bond and uh i think you did a wonderful wrap up tonight and uh with that wrap up, uh, we certainly will speak again. You take care of yourself, oh, and but, uh, uh, oh, I'm gonna stay on with you. I mean, believe me. When yeah, go on. Can you plug your information and how people can reach you? Thank you, thank you. You're so thoughtful. So uh, basically, so people can reach me almost anywhere. I'm totally doxxed and exposed on the internet, but try DouglasDietrich.com www.douglasdietrich.com. Bless you, dear brother, Sean Bond. Yeah, and he got it right this time uh, before it was upside down. So he got it right. Oh, yes, pepperology. Yeah. Oh, yeah, pepperology, <laughs> Douglas Dietrich. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, bless you. And uh, yeah, um, you're an angel. Thank you, Sean. So that's available on the internet through Amazon uh, Books. Just look up Vampirology, the uh, vampire research paper on Amazon and uh, enough of you buy copies of that and we can revise and expand it and get the whole story out there, uh, such as how Patient Zero was found, the connection to World War II, Operation Barbarossa, and of course the Nazi vampire units, the Nazi units of vampires. Um, so uh, it's, it's something that is important and that side of the story needs to be told to a greater extent. Uh, and uh, by God, um, uh, if you want to avoid Amazon for any reason, you can order it directly from Skybooks USA, or maybe you can't. I don't know. <laughs> but try Amazon for vampirology and try my website just for any other information. Uh, and at the website, DouglasDietrich.com, you'll find my physical mailing address if you ever have a need for that. Uh, so anybody who wants to send a check or money order, because I do need money to pay the rent. Uh, by God, uh, you can send it to 1242 1242 Green Street, like the color green, San Francisco, California, and the zip code is 94109. That's 94109. And for those of you, and I do encourage this heavily, uh, who want to sponsor me through PayPal or just provide a contribution, uh, by God, that's uh, paypal.me forward slash Douglas Dietrich. Uh, so uh, paypal.me forward slash Douglas Dietrich. Any help you can provide will be appreciated. And of course, I have my own YouTube channel, the Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel. Look up Douglas Dietrich on YouTube and uh, you'll find that uh, probably along with all kinds of character assassination from the cultists of the anti-gods, the cults of chaos. Uh, and uh, have discernment. Uh, I trust most of you have enough common sense where you can see the enemy for who they are. And uh, when it comes to uh, what I'm sharing with all of you now, none of this would be possible without Sean Bond. So uh, bless him and uh, Sean Bond, you are the man um uh, and we'll stay on call for a few moments after we end um interview of course but uh 
I'll let him in the interview with his own summation now that I uh, gave people what information that they need. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm Sean Bond of the SAC League, and you can reach me at SACLeague.com for uh, in the services for like consultations and a bunch of video products. I uh, make a bunch of uh, videos on uh, abilities to help people stabilize themselves, to heal, to overcome stresses and targeting and uh, accumulating more and more abilities as we seek to empower our uh, collective and uh, the collective humanoids and take uh, back their power from the, the forces that wish to enslave us and hold us back from our greatest selves. And then I'm also on uh, Sonic League at YouTube and a bunch of other places you can contact me like Facebook and other stuff. And yes, please donate to Douglas Dietrich. Uh, he uh, deserves it and um, he <laughs> for holding that much information in his head and and retaining it um, very valuable uh, walking library of uh, a billion suns worth of knowledge uh, so uh, lots of stuff to bring out in future shows show us your love tell us that uh, what you think in the comments and if you want to see more please share share as much as possible get it out there uh try to get it out to vampires if no uh, if you can <laughs> I doubt it. but like uh i don't know uh hopefully we get like a uh, i don't know because they can't really understand so whatever um you know um, but I, way, do, do you think they would sense you if they saw a picture of you like if somebody was that was a victim like like showed your youtube video no don't eat me <laughs> that's so cute actually I, you know when i try to emphasize what i did because of course i don't want people to continually romanticize them but um at the same time it's not necessarily as bad as i made it sound um vampires are able to communicate to an extent uh and uh, enough to pass off in a crowd so to speak uh and maintain maybe a low level functioning job in some for at least a period of time by that i mean months maybe or so so that they can uh have a feeding ground uh or access to something but it's uh it's it's like an autistic child it's like um there's only so much that can be done before people start noticing things uh so uh it's uh it's you know uh, not necessarily as feral as i made it sound but um not right. just you know you get the point and um uh but uh anyhow i love you dearly sean bond and uh i'm so proud of you for everything that you've done to make it this far in life through all of your challenges and uh yeah, I'm it's... Glad you this and that you're still alive and, and going strong yeah you do look younger so hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you and um so uh, i guess um whenever you're ready we'll end the interview then uh, sure hope you guys have a good uh night and uh see you in the next show <laughs>